Stella, welcome back to 10% True. It's good to see you. Thanks. Again. It's great to be back. I, I don't know how many times we've had these um, uh, little interview. I don't know. I don't want to call them interviews because they're more like chats nowadays. You know, I think early on it felt like, you know, it was a sort of standard affair uh, interviewing a guest. And now it just feels like having a chat with a mate. But I don't know how many times we've done it, but it's probably seven or eight, something like that. That's how many times you've been a, a guest on the channel. Let's put it that way. And what we've talked about is a range of topics. We've talked about um, AGM-88, harm the development of that missile and the development of the Wild Weasel mission. And I think actually that was the first time you were a guest on the channel. And from there, we've talked about your F-15E time hitting uh, the SA-3 in Mosul, your time in Deny Flight and, and um, uh, in the Balkans, um, Ally Force. Uh, but we haven't really talked about who you are as an individual in terms of where you came from and what made you decide to join the Air Force and go through the undergraduate navigator training program. And we also haven't talked about your first assignment to the F4G. So that's the purpose of the conversation today. And we did in our little warm up talk about uh, not laboring the point on your early years. But I do really want to get to the bottom of what makes you tick and, and what your influences were as a kid, uh, what you were doing and um, what it was about the Air Force that appealed to you or whether or not actually it was an accident that you ended up in the field that you're in. So, so tell us about that. What's your background story? So my background story, um, as a kid, at about the age of seven, right, I moved to New Zealand. This is a weird way to start a background story. And that is kind of the time frame where I decided I wanted to fly fighters. And as I trace back, I, I can account for two influences. And this is in the 70s, of course. One of them was war comics. So this was a thing in New Zealand and Australia in the 70s was comic books, black and white war stories. Wildly fantastical. The Germans and the Japanese were always the bad guys. Um, the Brits, unaccountably, and the Commonwealth forces were always the big hero. And there was one war comic called The Silver Spitfire about a ground mechanic who... Uh, has to evacuate Burma during the Japanese invasion, then becomes a uh, Spitfire pilot, and for some reason his Spitfire is never freaking painted, or painted silver, or something like that. I don't know what they look like when they're not painted, because that would be stupid. Uh, and of course he rages over the Mediterranean, fights in the Battle of Malta, gets however many kills, all his mates die, uh, and then he ends up going to Burma where he manages to help liberate the village that gave him his good luck charm in the first place. This is the Silver Spitfire. And the reason I remember this in such detail is because I got it on Kindle. I looked back. <laughs> I found it. I found, like, War Comic episode 17,769, right? And it's the Silver Spitfire. So I have it, and I reread it. That was actually a huge influence for comics like that. And the other was... There was a sh television show that my grandfather watched, and I would see, because he had cable television, which was new in the 70s, I would see when I visited my grandfather on home leave, called Ba Ba Black Sheep, later Black Sheep Squadron, about a fictional marine uh, fighter squadron in the Solomons in the Second World War. And that was it. I wanted to fly fighters. And there was a short period where I thought I wanted to fire fly marine fighters but since i don't eat crayons that was never really an option. <laughs> and so the that i i locked in that's what i wanted to do i wanted to fly fighter aircraft and it's because of these kind of influences and so by the age of nine certainly you know that was my plan okay <clears throat> i was gonna say so what went wrong <laughs> uh, yeah, so it actually went uh, it went fairly well. So we I moved from New Zealand to Australia. You know, New Zealand is kind of neat. I mean, I think of it as my second home country as a kid because I was there in some key years. Uh, but New Zealand immigration code doesn't necessarily agree with me. So unfortunately, that's that. But we moved to Australia. I moved to New Mexico. I actually lived in Los Alamos, which is that could be a key thing. I could be radioactive. Um. And then uh, high school in Cape Cod, where I managed to to get my way and get a four year Air Force ROTC scholarship for engineering, um, which was amazing. And uh, I decided to take that to Penn State, 
and I went to Penn State and I flunked out of engineering by the end of my third semester. I mean, I was not a dedicated engineering student because uh, for the first year, I mean, I changed majors from mechanical engineering to aerospace engineering because mechanical engineering, you had to take ME30 and it was always at eight o'clock in the morning, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And so I changed majors to avoid 8 a.m. class three times a week. And then aerospace, I, I did an internship at my father's engineering firm, you know, between my freshman and junior year and realized that engineers didn't do any of the stuff I was doing. They didn't do the math. If my dad needed a solution to a, a, a math problem, he either called the company math dude or he turned around and he had all these volumes of tables in engineering books. And he pulled one out of the bookcase and he looked up the answer and he put it back. That's what he did. He did not do integral calculus. He did not do differential equations. I'm sure he learned them all, but he didn't do them. So anyway, that uh, uh, that pretty much torpedoed. I was going to flunk out. I was flunking out of the program. I was going to lose the scholarship because I couldn't maintain the GPA. Uh, and then... The gods and the staff at Penn State's ROTC uh, detachment smiled on me because I had the second highest Air Force officer qualifying test scores they had ever seen at the school. And so they didn't want to lose me to the program, uh, which I'm sure they regretted that that whole thing later. But they didn't want to lose me from the program at the end of my third semester. So I was able to switch majors and switch scholarships. So I... I changed into poli sci as a major and I got an upgrade. I got a NAV scholarship, a two and a half year navigator scholarship when we still had a two and a half year scholarship program. And that program was terminated not two weeks after I signed on the dotted line. Okay, so if you've ever heard, I'd rather be lucky than good, I'll tell you that any fighter aviator got to fly fighters because they're lucky. Uh, yes, there's an element of good in there, but but some point a break or a series of breaks went their way, and I had a series of breaks go my way, uh, and that was a NAP scholarship. And uh, I was actually offered a pilot slot in my senior year, and I turned it down because I wasn't sure that I wanted to fly up front, but more importantly, I could make that decision later, and a pilot slot doesn't pay for your school whereas a NAV scholarship does. So I elected to come out of college debt-free uh, uh, and go to NAV school. And, I, and I, I, I graduated, I was commissioned. I worked in a bakery for the summer till the Air Force felt like putting me on active duty. Like every other ROTC graduate at the time, you basically starved to death between commissioning and when the Air Force brought you on active duty. And then I went off to Mather Air Force Base for specialized undergraduate NAV training. So this is where I pause and let you get in a question before I start doing more stream of consciousness stuff. Well, the obvious one is that <clears throat> you um, talk then about your reading the comic books and and thinking that's what I want to do. And then you've just said you weren't sure if you wanted to be up front. What? Why weren't you sure? Probably because one of the aviators or the actually only aviator in our detachment, our instructional detachment, was uh, Major Markley, who was an F-4 backseater. So that may have had some influence, but also really the electronic warfare piece, even then, was appealing to me in college. Uh, the ravens looked interesting, the weasels looked interesting, and pilots didn't get to do that stuff. Um, so as anybody, very few people know exactly what air force specialty code they want to go into you know in the college you're always kind of feeling your way through it and at that point i was feeling my way through it had you had an opportunity to fly anything uh, it was was part of under the the rotc program to go up and fly little cessnas or anything like that any, any flying experience no but the the air force has a civilian auxiliary in the united states called civil air patrol and Civil Air Patrol actually does a lot of search and rescue in some states, and I was in two of those states. So I was in CAP in Massachusetts and Pennsylvania Wings, and both do a lot of search and rescue. And as part of that, cadets get some basic aviation training. You know, so I had some unlogged time in the occasional uh, Piper Warrior or, you know, Cessna 172, um, or, you know, in the back of a UH-1 for that matter. Um, those were... 
the, those I did have some flying experience. My first flying experience, actually, though, was as a Boy Scout for my aviation badge when I was in Los Alamos, which was a 1947 Stevenson station wagon is the name of the airplane. Wow. And I've never even bothered to look it up. And I was I was a young Boy Scout, so I could not see over the engine cowling. So anytime we're flying VFR, you know, we take off from the mountains. We take off, we're at 7,800 feet where we take off, and we're flying over the valley. Um, and I'm trying to navigate my way towards Espanola, but I can't see Espanola <laughs> under the cowlings. Every time I wanted to get a visual fix, I had to dip the nose. In order to see, and oh yeah, that's Espanola, and then pull the nose back up. So I remember that. I remember my first flight, you know, quite vividly. What I really needed was a big ass phone book. But at that time, you know, the Sinon to raise me up. But at that time, Los Alamos only had thirty thousand people. The phone book was that big, and that included the town of White Rock. So you know, nobody has forty seven phone books lying around. So I had to dip the nose. I digress. <laughs> So, so without wishing to age you, then this is all happening in the eighties, isn't it? Um, so I lived in Los Alamos from seventy-seven to seventy-nine, and then all the rest of it, uh, high school, college, is happening in the eighties. And I yeah. arrive at Mather Air Force Base in November of nineteen eighty-eight. So, so what point? Uh, I, I, it's a, it's a recurring theme. So you see it on our Discord channel where we talk. Um, you see it in some of the interviews that I do, where you know you talk about people in multi-crew aircraft well f fighters i'm talking about fighters you know two 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 seat aircraft there are no three seat fighters that i'm aware of um certainly not on our side of the fence but at what point then did you re did you come to sort of decide then that being a nav ewo was what you wanted and, and and is there a process of sort of putting to bed or or finding peace with the idea that you're not going to go and drive you know you're going to be um, sitting in the back being driven but as you know you, you you seem really comfortable with it but but you definitely feel that there's a rift between those two, two let's say crew positions you the, the, it's impossible to deny that sometimes it feels like there's a rift you know and um, there's there's angst towards pilots and pilots that sometimes have angst towards wizards um so i'm curious to know understand the psychology behind it behind saying okay that's where my career is going i'm happy with that yeah, so I don't, I, I think it was just I kind of fell into something that looked really interesting. And what actually happened when I was flying F4Gs is I was being pressured at Spangdalem to fly, uh, to apply to pilot training. And I started an application for pilot training. And then when it, it looked like Saddam was going to kick things off again in 1992, what turned into the Southern No-Fly Zone, I trashed my application. Uh, because I was just not interested in turning back around and starting over just so I could sit in the front seat, which didn't seem uh, too terribly attractive uh, because I really liked what I was doing. And that that was the point at which we pretty much nailed it. And yes, I will admit, there is often... So in a good a crew arrangement, there is no tension between front and back. Um, where you have... Tension from the back seat to the front seat is where the pilot's a dick. And where you have tension from the front seat to the back seat is when the pilot's a dick. And so under those two conditions, that's it's, you know, that's just the way it works. Okay. Um I, I, I'm I'm happy with that then as an introduction to the topic of, of flying the F4G. Where, where do you want to go from here? You you tell me what you want to talk about because this is you know in line with some of the really cool stuff that you've brought to, um, you know the audience here. You've got some APQ 120 radar video. You've got some Maverick video. We've got some great anecdotes coming. Um, and so what I don't want to do is sort of steer the the conversation in the direction away from where you want it to go, which is it sounds like an odd thing to say, but. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about being introduced to fast jet flying, uh, being introduced to the F4G, starting to learn about those systems? Is that a topic of conversation that you think has some um, some level of interest, or do you want to go straight into arriving at uh, your first operational squadron? No, I'll connect the dots. Um, so, you know, the dots need to be connected at NAV training. So uh, specialized undergraduate navigator training was a new thing. It had only been in for less than two years. And everybody starts out in core. Okay, and core is, I don't know, 14 weeks. I was class 8907, 
And from there, you're going to track out. You're either going to go fighter, EWO, or tanker transport bomber. And if you want, by the way, to be a fighter EWO, you have to go to EWO school and then you have to go to fighter school. But those are, that's not a, a continuous track anymore. It used to be that you went and got, got, you know, graduated with your wings and then went to EWO school. No. So what I had to do is I had to graduate in the top of my core class and be able to pick EWO school, which I did. I was a number one American in the core class. I say number one American because we also trained the Germans. And because they are very well organized and very good students and because they cheat like crazy, <laughs> um, those guys could very well have outscored me. Um, and then I went to EWO school and I've got 13 people in EWO school, which is unusual. Class size was 13, including Sherry Zabel, by the way. Um, and the the 13 size was unusual, but now I had to compete and get a fighter. Um, and, you know, it turns out I was not number one at an EWO school. Jay DeLong edged me out by a couple fractions of a point. Um, but I ended up getting all the awards because they didn't count the last test when they were giving out the awards. And so Jay didn't edge me until I'd already crossed the finish line. Um, so then I have to go to fighter training. And, you know, in fighter training, uh, it was it was weird. Um, at that time, the first two EWOs, uh, Friels and Mac were the two guys. The first two guys to come out of Mather and go in the Strike Eagle, which was the big thing then, uh, were Brad Friels, and I can't remember what General Mac's name is. Sorry, General. Um, but uh, it's General, obviously. <laughs> um, and after that, there was a rule for a while, no more EWOs in Strike Eagles straight out of the school. You know, they were going to actually take guys that went through the, the far track without going through EWO school. So as far track rounded up, the number one guy was Jay DeLong. Uh, Ewo, can't go to Strike Eagles, gets a 111. The number two guy is me. Ewo, Strike Eagle isn't first on his list anyway. Weasel is, bang, goes to a weasel. Jason Dahlquist, Ewo, um, can't go to a Strike Eagle, goes to a wild weasel, you know, which was probably the better choice for him. So... And I can't remember who the fourth guy was, um, but I think it was the fourth guy in line that got the first strike eagle. So the first three guys were passed over because they were EOs, and everybody else went to a strike eagle. Works out for me because it wasn't, because I recall the F4G was my number one choice. So anyway, that's that gets you to nav school, and then you go through survival school and water survival and and land survival and lead in fighter training at Holloman which is a great time, flying AT-38s around. You only had seven syllabus sorties as a wizzo, and then you sandbagged. So, you know, I got to sandbag in the back of a T-38 as we fought uh, uh, F-15s down at Holloman, which was fun. And we did a bunch of low level. And for the student pilots, it's the first time they have somebody in the back seat that is not an instructor, that is actually there to help them and not bust them on a ride. And so that's where guys... At the first, you know, go, they don't want anybody in the back seat because all I've ever had is an instructor in the back. And then there's other guys going, oh, yeah, this could be good. <laughs> so even that early, you end up getting a mix. Uh, and then I go to George Air Force Base, which is in Southern California in the high desert, uh, in the middle of freaking nowhere. It's a prison now. Um, And that puts me through F4E transition. So that's where I have my F4E time is because the transition course is F4Es, and we flew, you know, F4Es with the Tizio, the camera sticking out of the wing, and we learned this, that, and the other thing, and then we go to the weasel school. And so when when I arrived at George, I arrived in late June, and in August, Saddam invades Kuwait. So bang, bunch of the we the 561st fighter squadron goes. They take a bunch of instructors from the 562nd fighter squadron, you know, and there we are. It's like, oh man, we got to get through this program before the war kicks off, and that doesn't happen. You know, we don't graduate the whole program, RTU plus the Weasel School. That's a year long program, uh, and rightfully so. And so I missed the whole thing. And that, of course, gets to the root of all my modern psychological problems is having uh, missed the first Gulf War. Um, and so that's that's the weasel school. I mean, it's good. You transitioned G's. The instructors were good. 
um, mostly. Um, you know, I did have uh, my crew student pilot at one point uh, try to kill me uh, in the e-course uh, several times and other people. Um, but that he did not succeed in that, so that worked out for everybody. And tell the story. What did he do? So there were four. There were four problems. I was only in like two of them. One, we actually busted our emergency procedures check for my check ride um, because I initiated ejection too late. I hadn't learned yet to ignore the pilot when he says I got it. <laughs> um, and I was in the envelope, and he was out of the envelope. I thought, you know, from a simism standpoint, that. Um, when you pull the ejection handles, as long as you hadn't hit the ground yet, you were good. Okay, but that's not the case. The case is that when you pull the ejection handle, the sim freezes, all the data is recorded, and you determine whether or not the seats were in the envelope or out. So uh, that wasn't one of the ones that tried to kill me. It, it was a pity because my my actual check ride was textbook perfect. They would have saved it. They would have saved the tape to use as an instructional tool, except we were the last class, so who cares? But... Uh, uh, the pilot in question had a traffic pattern stall um, where the IP and back had to save. And remember, you can't get in the afterburner from the back seat in an F4G. Um, we had, I think, another maybe departure. Um, we had one of the few times I've actually gone for the stick uh, in the back of an F4 where on a rejoin, he had too much smash. And I was you know, reaching for the stick when the pilot the in the airplane I was in, we were being rejoined on. Suddenly realizes and bang, we're in a snap turn away. Um yeah, so there were a number of of, of issues there. Um it, the the guy probably should have been washed out, but he wasn't. Um and so, you know, I survived and most of my in the wheel school my crude pilot was Dave Lucia. And you're gonna hear Dave uh, on the radar tape. Ah, uh, because he's, he's one of my favorite pilots. Just just quickly, Star Baby, then. You, can you give us a quick pricey of the EWO school and what level of foundational knowledge it creates that you then build on in the Wild Weasel school? Um, so I'm guessing EWO school is sort of platform agnostic. It is semi-platform agnostic. So um, you're learning a lot of things about RED uh, air defense systems, radars, aircraft, a little bit about jammers, jamming techniques, uh, electronic protection techniques, low-level flying uh, starts, although it's not really low-level when you're flying in a converted 737. Um, you still learn the techniques. Uh, you know, you get a, I can't remember, I think you get a couple T-37 rods uh, there doing actual low-level, but that certainly happens in, in FAR. But the simulator, the simulator was amazing. Um, and so there's, you actually go through a number of sims. So the first one is the signal recognition sim where you're simulating being an RC-135 and you have to identify all these signals by audio. You have to be able to listen to this signal and tell what it is. Um, most guys actually are pretty good at that. It's amazing how the brain works. So a hundred percent is the normal grade. Uh, on that particular simulator rod. You get 20 signals, and they're not always the same, so you can't ask your buddy what he heard. There's a big signal library, and you got to know more than 20. <laughs> uh, and you got to get them all right. And then you go to the EF-111 sim, and the EF-111 sim uh, is all about jammer allocations, so you're learning EF-111. You know, you have a... a, a it doesn't move or anything, but you're flying through your mission, you know, with your virtual pilot, and you've got to allocate all the jammers. And so you learn about that mission. The weasel part had actually been disconnected because it was an F-105G weasel. So you were dealing with, you know, single strobe, APS-101 radar warning gear, and that was considered to not be um, really useful, although I would have loved to do it. It's more likely that that part no longer worked. <laughs> That's why it was removed from the, sim uh, from the simulator. And then you had to do, as a graduation simulator, was the B-52 sim. It was the strat phase, the strategic phase. That was believed to be brutal. That was the hardest part because there's a lot of manual stuff. You know, you've got to manage your time to die meter. You have to manage your chaff and flares. I mean, manage. You just have to dispense them at the right time. I mean, with 900 bundles of chaff or something <laughs> like that on board the airplane, it's not like you're going to run out in a one-hour sim, right? Um, I, I think I could probably have leaned on the button from simulated takeoff <laughs> to end of mission and not run out of chaff. Um, 
And you know, you've got to dial in jammers and you've got to let the you've got to turn on the ALQ one seventy two, which is an automatic system. So the whole ALQ one seventy two use consists of turning it on properly. Um, you know, and there were older jammers in there that you also had to deal with in the low frequency bands. Uh so that was uh pretty intense. But that's what nailed the F four G for me. Where the simulators in Ewa School, even though I didn't get to do a weasel simulator, that was it. I wanted to kill Sams. I wanted to outthink Sam operators. I wanted to put warheads on foreheads. Uh, and, you know, really the fandom was still around. It was in its sunset years. But but the fandom was, that was the airplane that I had kind of envisioned myself in in the 70s. I mean, at, a, at the age of 10 or 11, you envision yourself in a lot of things. I mean, I envisioned myself in an F-4 uh, in the Lord of the Rings uh, at the Battle of Pelennor Fields dropping napalm on orcs. So, <laughs> oh, totally. <laughs> I think it would have totally changed the tenor of the battle, and I think I don't care how strong your Nazgulness <laughs> is. If you take a bunch of 20 millimeter, at least your your ride is going down. <laughs> <laughs> um, you should speak to Peter Jackson about the uh, the Star Baby remake of the Lord oh, of the Rings. That would be great. Um, I'd have to. I'd want to play myself, but I don't know how I'd play myself as an eleven year old. <laughs> oh come on! Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, what the heck? We could digitally fake it. <laughs> so that's the Ewo school. The Ewo school is what really, you know, sank it in. Yes, I want to fly weasels. I want to kill Sams. It gives you the basic knowledge. And so when you get to the, the 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 weasel school and you're actually putting this all in APR 47, you know, you know what you're looking at. You know why you're prioritizing the things. You you know about ambiguities. Um. So one of the things I, you know, it used to be, and one of the things that, uh, there's always a sort between the two ship if you can't communicate. So you'll take a certain certain SAMs and I will take certain SAMs. And the lead EWO briefs it, and it could be anything. It could be, you know, you take the ones below this number, you take the ones above this number. Uh, one of the sorts was, this was Rain Man that briefed it. He would brief old EWO, old SAMs. <laughs> EWO, new SAMs. I mean... And that's legit. I did a foolproof sort in that I would I would have the sort go by the Sams that were ambiguous in one way or another. So, you know, the two and the six have overlap in the frequency bands. So um, you're going to take twos and sixes. The other guy's going to take three eights and alphas. So the threes and alphas, which are in the aircraft, uh, had some ambi ambiguity. The system might... Uh, not correctly identify a three or certain types of AAA. And the eight looks like a three when they're all overlapped. So in my sort, you could not lose. If you took something that looked like an eight, you were good. You were in your sort, even if it was a three. You know, and twos and sixes, you could totally blow the ambiguity and have forgotten everything you learned in the audio ID scheme, and you'd still be uh, in the sort. So I had Star Baby's foolproof sort. And that was what EWO school kind of prepared you to do was to realize all the ways that um, you needed to execute the tactics based on uh, what the Russians did. And that was actually a bonus when my first assignment came around that I went to Spangdalem. Um, let me step back. Spangdalem. <laughs> what a great base. Because we went through school with Germans, right? And even the five fighter tracks, we had Germans. Those of us that thought we were going to weasels or wanted weasels were asking questions about being stationed in Germany. We're asking the German students. And we find that at least some of the German students kind of view the Eiffel region where Spangdalem is as the rural backwoods. So I remember, you know, I was married, so it wasn't an issue, but guys are asking about the food and guys are asking about the girls and... And, you know, we so we go to one of the guys who's from the region and and guys start asking him questions and he, you know, says the food's pretty good and and you know, it's a very rural region and they go, you know, it has lots of cows and you know, there's milk production and there's Bitburger beer. And one of the guys asks him flat out, so what about the women? He goes, Do women go at the cows? <laughs> <laughs> and so but uh, we also got the German food rules out of this. So the German food rules, which have never, ever let me down, 
And this is almost an exact quote. Never eat anything beginning with the letter L unless it ends in Wurst or Schnitzel. And you can always eat something that ends in Wurst or Schnitzel unless it begins with Blut, which is German <laughs> for blood. Those are the German food rules. They have never steered me wrong. So we go to Spangdown, show up. The war is over. Everybody in the squad, and even the lieutenants, are freaking war heroes, and I'm just a dude who's arrived after it's all over. Um, this turns out to only be a semi-healthy squadron. At least it, to the time I was there, it didn't have any F-16 guys in it, so we didn't have that fault line um, in the <laughs> system. But, you know, I was learning a lot, and there were a bunch of great guys, but there was also a division of war hero, non-war hero. Um, you know, but, uh, it was a good location to be in, uh, guys knew what they were talking about. It was a great place to learn. Uh, weapons officer was Kurt Lohod, uh, who was uh, really, really a stud. Um, you know, and you had plenty of guys who were willing to bring the young Ewos along. Um, so it worked out pretty well and the German food rules are good and we're living off in the economy and, uh. You know, I arrive there and it's like, hey, you can go to Green Flag if you get mission ready in time. So I go, I arrive in July, Green Flag's in August. I burn through my MQ training and so do the other EWOs from my class, Darren Colarusso and Jason Dahlquist. Um, they, they burn through so that we can go to Green Flag. Um, so that's your, at the time, that was your electronic work flag so you know we haven't been in germany for you know five weeks before we're up and and we're back in nevada uh flying a green flag which is great experience um you know and i gained some credibility because i always went with my whiz wheel my circular slide roll our computer flight planning system completely crunched we only had one of them we packed it up we brought it with us it did not work when we got to nellis but for a red flag, you can just spin a generic flight plan, what we call a Form 70. And I had my whiz wheel, and I'm fresh out of school, so I remember how to do all this stuff. I just spun all the generic Form 70s. It's minor heroism, but the fact is it's recognized, um, you know, that I could step in in this case where the flight planning computer failed and nobody else wanted to be bothered with anything uh, as far as the planning. So... That was good, flew a bunch of missions, learned a bunch of lessons, made a bunch of stupid mistakes. One of which is, if you're being jammed, screaming louder into the radio does not, <laughs> in fact, counter the jamming. And everybody does it. You have to learn not to do it. But that's, if you listen to red flag tapes, you can tell the lieutenants are, because they're they're crying to get their point across and they're using volume. It's like, yeah, that that has nothing to do with signal power on your radio, pal. And, you know, I'm an Ewo. I know this intellectually, but you just have to get through it. Um, and then we come back, and I end up going on my first deployment to, uh, Zar well, first, you know, training deployment to Zaragoza, Spain. And Spike, in the previous episode, has already told a naming ceremony. The, the, I'm, I'm going to, I'm just, let me pause you there before you go into the, Zar the Zaragoza deployment. But, um, just take you back to what you said about the split, um, the sort of war hero, sort of non-war hero split. Um, I just wanted to explore that a little bit. Not, you know, don't have to go on about it for too long, but how much of that is a psychological thing? How much of that plays out in behavior? Um, where does it come from? And what do you do with that? How do you, um, um, you know, sort of neutralize that or, or, or kill it? Or is it healthy? It sounds like it's not, but... You know, are there elements of it that are useful as as motivators? What what does what, what it? You know, how do you really think about it? It's not healthy. It can be exacerbated by poor leadership. It is not intentional. It's not that the guys that went to the war are looking at you as anything other than the new guys. But for example, we had like a squadron event, which is allegedly a squadron event, but it was only for people that went in the war. You know, so you have a dinner event and it's like only for people that went to the war and not for, you know, anybody else. And that that's an automatic split. Um, in my case, I felt inferior. It's not that I was being other than, you know, social things like that. It's, it's not that I was being 
treated as a second class citizen, although I felt I was being treated as a second class citizen. Um, because I wasn't there, I didn't have the experience. So it's definitely not healthy. I think different leadership might have uh, nipped that in the bud, but they didn't. Uh, and so when it came time to to go to Base X, which was the, the, going to be the final weasel squadron, which was someplace else that was only moved to Nellis. Nellis started out as BX, as Base X. I was part of the initial cadre because I couldn't wait to get the hell out of Spangdahl. Um, because I needed to break contact with that squadron and um, kind of drive a stake in the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, I, having said all of that, atmospherics, it didn't matter. I, I didn't see a difference when I was actually on deployment. You know, it was kind of more a social thing at home base. Um, so there we go. It's 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 probably was the same thing seen in Vietnam where guys had joined the squadron after the squadron just came back from a year, probably felt exactly the same way for the same reasons. Um, you know, guys that came into the 494th in late 1999 probably felt exactly the same way for the same reasons. Um, so there we go. Okay, S second question then before you move on and uh, talk about Zaragoza. You s talked about the Star Baby Sword, and it made me wonder... You know, at the point that you joined the F4G Wild Weasel community, how much had they had, had they figured everything out? You know, how much room was there for you to come in and do your thing and, you know, other than the E6B um, uh, sort of flight calculator, you know, to, to come in and, and make a difference? And, you know, it's interesting you say the Star Baby Sort and you just, you describe the logic behind it sort of makes sense. Uh, is that a, a an isolated example of something that they had not thought about? You know, you able to come in and leave a, a an imprint on the community and the squadron. Um, what does that uh, What does that look like at that point? How mature is it? Uh, there were apps. There was absolutely room for tactics development to continue to go on. In fact, I was a squadron nominee in like 1995 for the Claire Chenault Award for tactics development. <laughs> um. So that would tell you that I was able to do something. Um, yes, there might have been other guys that briefed the sword for the same way, but I never heard it explained to me. You've just suddenly lost focus. Oh, Don't get me wrong, no, I kind of like it. I was going to say, uh, I wasn't looking at me, but um, let's see if I can pull it back. No, wait a minute. That's better. I mean, the F4 is in focus. That's what really matters. And that's I think true, yeah. So, it'll, uh, it'll, it'll find me soon enough. Okay, there we go. Um, speaking of losing focus, see, this is what happens when you're ADD. This happens to you all the time. Well, let me, let me try and get it back then. Um, so you can fucking piece of shit. Definitely going to have to cut this bit out. Actually, I'm going to leave it in. <laughs> never make these little cuts. That's true. Uh, I don't know what's going on. I don't know why it suddenly lost focus. Who cares? All right. Okay. Sorry. If you just take your glasses off, you won't notice that it's not focus and you're good to go. So, yeah, there was room for tactics development. I had never seen anybody brief that sort that way, but they might have briefed the sort that way. They just, nobody explained it to me that that was their rationale behind the sort. Uh, there was room to assist on the software development. So I was the ops rep for the development of Tape 9000. And with guys from the 422, the weasel guys in the 422, uh, like Paul Dowden and Guy Hooper explaining certain things to me, um, you know, I was able to make a really great set of inputs that led to the final software tapes. Jason Dahlquist did the same thing for the uh, software on the navigation system. So when we got handheld Garmin GPSs in our survival vests, uh, Jason had anticipated the whole method of like freezing your coordinates, freezing the INS, and then back entering data. And that was already there. So uh, there were definitely opportunities for uh, new guys to get things, to ask questions about the radar tape. Why are we capped? Why is our AIM-7 range capped for us when it's not capped for the Eagles? Um, and the, all those changes were still being made. Um, well, you know, plus they're probably... then? Pardon? What was that about then? What was that about then? Why would you have a, an AIM-7 range capped? Um, because we had not updated the software when we transitioned from the AIM-7E3 to the AIM-7F. Um, and it did not take into a, so the AIM-7 E3 was a boost only motor and, um, it was white and the AIM-7 F was boost sustain and it was gray. And so we still had an artificial cap on our maximum shot range, 
when the shot range was farther because the missile had better kinematics and it wasn't a power thing because we, you know, unlike, you know, modern fighters, which might, uh, guide the weapon without a continuous wave illuminator. We had a continuous wave illuminator and it, it, you just turn, flip the switch, turn on the Klystron, and there is this high energy beam of doom going out in front of you. Uh, so it wasn't a power issue either, but all those things had to be adapted. Um, there was plenty of room for tactics development and innovation. It happened all the time. Just... <sighs> Doing my head in there. Talk to the head. Fuck. What is going on? Okay, that's might... better. Let me, let me just unplug it and uh, plug it back in again. I'll, I'll disappear for a second, obviously, but... Unplug the right one. Here we go. Ooh, now it just said Steve Davies. We're still recording. I'm, I'm still here. I am definitely still here, but um, i got to restart my video. There we go. And you're in focus. Piece of shit. <laughs> okay, I'm not cutting it out. It's all staying in. Uh, <laughs> Adds flavor, I told you. <laughs> um, okay, so Zara goes, I interrupted you anyway. So right, Zara, so Zara it's Gosa. a good thing you remembered because I would have totally blown it. So Zaragoza... Um, was you know it was actually the last training detachment we're going to be the last americans there before you close the base and spain was great the range was good you're flying by castles of course we're flying by castles in germany but we could go lower in spain um and there were a couple of interesting events that happened uh uh there um one is the worst pilot i've ever freaking flown with um, who was unaccountably an instructor, um, toxic personality at work. Although if you were just hanging around with him, you know, waxing his boat or whatever else you happen to do, um, you might think he was an all right, all right guy, but he was not a good pilot. He was not a good tactician. And uh, he was a complete Schwanzenheimer in the squadron all the time. And so we had a sortie against we're flying against Eagles, which is great. Uh, and we commit 2v2, and we get the uh, the radar warning. They, they, they've got us. They have us before we have any situational awareness. I'm listening to the to the radar signal. Guy goes into single target track. I go, dude, come left to the notch. We have to notch. And I say it several times, and he does jack. Okay, we just drive straight forward into a couple of simulated AIM-7s and get called dead. That's bad enough. But when we get to the debrief, um, you know, his summary of the first engagement was, yeah, we got killed because my backseater was cold mic and wasn't checking six. It's like, what? That's, that's bullshit. Run the tape. And the guy will not run the tape. And not only that, but he doesn't put the tape back in the vault. He takes it on with him on his next sortie so he can overwrite it. I mean, I had never seen anything like that happen in a debrief before or since. I was practically in tears um, because I, I just just so frustrated that I could not get this debrief to explain what had really happened, which was we had been killed because we failed to go to the notch. Um, and there was no situational awareness. So remember when I talk about guys, you can suck the SA out of everybody in the flight. Here's one of them. But my flight commander, my flight commander is Howdy Hansen, war hero, first night over Baghdad, lead backseater, uh, big old Viking dude. Um, and he set down the law. He said, I will not fly with that pilot for the next year. He put a block in scheduling, and I didn't have to fly with him again for the next year. Wow. Um, unfortunately, uh, he went with us to the uh, uh, 561st and is now a contributing reason why I'm less inclined to fly Southwest Airlines. But uh, nevertheless, that was one of the Zaragoza events. Um, the other one was dive toss. The dive toss competition. This comes into the naming ceremony because our opso at the time was Pito Day. Oh, Pito Day was a great dude. And I, I really think it, the squadron would have been different if he'd been the next squadron commander, but he was moved over to the op support squadron, which is a, a normal kind of thing, be the OSS commander. Pito was a great guy, but he was wasted. And so we had is the naming ceremony is near the end of the the weapons training detachment, the WTD. We're talking about all the events, you know, 30 degree dive bomb, 10 degree lay down or 20 degree lay down, um, 10 degree low angle bomb. Uh, 
And, you know, we've got scores because we're dropping blue bombs on the range. You know, we're giving out awards for the scores. And Altini, Haji, wins dive toss. It's like, Wizzo wins dive toss. And he gets the award and he comes up and he goes back again. And then two events later, he gets called up again because he won dive toss. And so now we realize that Pito has not recognized that he's giving the dive toss award. So after every other award, we'd yell out, who won dive toss? And he'd go back to his list and he'd call up Altini because he won dive toss. <laughs> and he'd look for the certificate and it wasn't there because he'd already given it to Al. And it didn't seem to matter because Al would go up, they'd shake hands, they'd say, oh, I'll give you the certificate later. We'd go back, he'd give another award now for 30 degree dive bomb. We'd all yell, who won dive toss? It's like, oh, and the whole thing would repeat. It was like a guy that was stuck on repeat. Who won dive toss? And so that was another one of those. We talk about things that get stuck in the squadron for a while. Who won dive toss is one of them. Um, <laughs> That's there is somewhere, there was actually some video taken of that naming ceremony, which I hope for other people's sake never comes to light. But one of the things it would record that Spike forgot to tell is that he required me to break dance once they <laughs> years on me. And I do not know how to break dance. So my solution to break dancing is to lie on my back on the floor and tell Spike to grab my feet and spin me around, which happens. Okay, so Spike, of course, doesn't remember this because he's too freaking wasted um, as he recounts. But nevertheless, that is the final piece of the naming ceremony that I was required to break dance because Spike was the master of ceremonies and he was lit. So you I think there might, there might be a video of that? Uh, Earl Odom, call sign Charo. Oh, now I have to tell this story. <laughs> it's because it was a Zaragoza thing. <laughs> Sorry, Earl, but this is just too good. Uh, Charo spelled with two R's. So naturally we're going out. Uh, oh yeah, geez, I, I need to tell the live bait story too. Okay, so let's start with Charo. Um, It's a, guys are out and I come back relatively early because they got boring and they're drunk. And as I recall, we needed to get somebody back. Uh, we probably needed to get Bun Boy back because he was starting to annoy the ladies and he was going to get us all knifed. Um, so we take the taxi back. I go to bed and at two o'clock in the morning, the fire alarm goes off and, uh, I figure it's just some drunken moron has pulled the fire alarm, but I open up the door and there's smoke in the hallway and it's like, oh, this is not a prank. So I go out and evacuate and, you know, we go, there's smoke pouring out of the other wing. The fire department guys showed up. Here's what happens. Earl Odom comes back a little bit late, decides he's got the munchies, puts on a pot because these were, these cues had stoves, electric stoves, puts on a pot, fills it full of water, drops some Raymond noodles in it, puts it on full. It is only going to take you know, a couple of minutes to, to do this and passes out face down, fully clothed on his bed. <laughs> so this thing is going and the water boils away and the Raymond noodles turn into carbon and they start generating shitloads of smoke. We set off the detector. The fire alarm gets pulled. The fire department shows up. His roommate, Kevin Mannion, is also passed out. <laughs> and he wakes up to a guy in a silver reflective spacesuit going, Sir, sir, you have to get out. And so that's the first thing he sees waking up from a drunken student is a spaceman talking to him. And so the way he tells it, he sits up. And in the process of sitting up, he has gone from clear air to smoke-filled air. <laughs> and he thinks, oh, this is bad. And so we evacuate the place. The heat was so intense, the aluminum pot actually deformed. Um, and, you know, an hour later, everybody's back in, and there's a faint smell of carbonized uh, whatever Raymond noodles are made out of, uh, you know, permeating that <laughs> wing of the the cues, but I wasn't living in that wing of the queue, so it was okay. <laughs> um, but that happened, that was the night, the final uh, denouement to the Green Bean Tour. So the Green Bean Tour is a tradition in Zaragoza, at least among the Weasel Squadrons, where you take the green beans, the new guys, out, and the brown beans pay for it. So we get a bus, they, the, you, you put your landing 
the Inuit, and you're going to go out and you're going to get the green beans uh, wasted and have them do strange things while they're hammered. And so you're going into a section of Zaragoza that is called the Tubes. It is this rapid warren of bars and um, bars and perhaps bars uh, in some section of the city that I would probably never be able to find again. And so wisely, they rent, they get an Air Force bus to bring us down and uh, Tombs, Toomey, uh, has the songbook and he is the leader of the band. So we're singing disgusting fighter pilot songs, you know, with all their glorious profanity as we drive into the tubes and then finally we hop out. And it starts easy. So you're eating like tapas. And uh, before they're called tapas, before anybody but the Spanish knows what the hell a tapa is and whether or not it's singular or plural. So the, the first one is like your standard, you know, fried potatoes and tomato sauce and it's awesome. Um, and then we go down and, you know, we start with the baby octopus and garlic sauce, which is also awesome. And they're drinking this cheap red wine called Tinto. Uh, and how you can get blasted on this stuff is beyond me. And there's not a water or a Coca-Cola to be found, so I am rapidly dehydrating. Um, you know, and I'm carrying around my cup of Tinto for local cover, and we're getting louder. And I start to notice as we go in deeper into the tubes that bars are closing in front of us and reopening after the pack has swept through. So they're not throwing us out of the bars. They're just preventing us from going in. Guys are still going their order foods. Next come the deep fried baby robins. Also excellent. Deep fried baby robins. As in the bird? Yeah, as in the bird. Wow. You should try some. It would add something to English cuisine. You guys know... <laughs> No ability to, to put your nose up at Spanish food. Because the deep fried robins are pretty good, but apparently it is low class to eat the feet. You're supposed to hold them by the feet, do the deep fried robin, and throw the feet away. We did not know that, so we're eating the feet. Because we're Americans. <laughs> and then we're in this section of town, and now it comes to what I refer to as the live bait incident. And so what I get to eat now, and I think it's Bart Quinn that hands it to me, is a fish. It's this raw freaking fish on a plate. And what you're supposed to do, apparently, is the fish has somehow been marinated or prepared slightly, or the fish is just this way, but you can actually just slide the meat off the fish bones, and you're just eating fish, raw fish, no big deal. We do not know that. So I say, well, what the heck? So... I grab the fish by the tail, I put the first half of the fish in my mouth, and I bite off the front half and pull the tail away. And I'm on my third chew when I realize I'm tasting what I had previously imagined fish guts taste like. Oh my God. This is a, a raw fish in all its glory. It is not a fish fillet. I'm eating the head and the forward part of the, what would be the abdominal cavity. So here I am, and so this is going to be tough. And Dave Lucia, again, Santa, one of my favorite pilots, is across from me, and he sees that I'm in distress. He's done the same thing, only he's blasted. And Dave, for all his qualities, is an evil drunk. Um, In that if he can mess with you, he's gonna. And if he doesn't like you, he's going to mess with you harder. I'm fortunate that he likes me, or it could have gone very badly. So he gets down on his knees in front of me so I can get a better view because I'm kind of looking down at the ground and starts chewing his fish with his mouth wide open. Just to make this worse. That's what actually stabilized me. Okay? In that I realized that I could just spit out this fish over day right now. <laughs> and nobody, not even him, would fault me for it at any point. Okay? But, you know, I'm trying to get first lieutenant points, so I'm choking this fish down. And now I have to go to my Tinto. You know, I've got to take a sip of Tinto to clear it. And Santa sees this and he swizzles the ass end of his fish into my Tinto. <laughs> and it's like, you son of a bitch. Here, swap. And so we swap cups of Tinto because what Santa knows and I don't is that he's already swizzled his fish ass <laughs> in his Tinto. So it is not a step up. <laughs> So I finally get this mouthful of fish guts down and I'm holding this ass end of a fish 
trying to figure out what the hell I'm going to do now with my fish ass and cup of contaminated Tinto. And Bart Quinn comes back and grabs my fish ass so he can go give it to the lieutenant. And I'm saved. And it's shortly after that that we decide we have to get uh, Bun Boy home in a in a taxi. <laughs> and uh, uh, you know, we four of us piled in. One of them is one of us is completely incoherent. And what we play to pay for the taxi? This is a current trick: is you play a valve stem game. Okay, so everybody takes a tire. You pick a tire, and you pick a somebody picks a clock position. In this case, it was twelve o'clock. And when the taxi stops to let you out, the person with the valve stem closest to 12 o'clock has to pay for the ride. And so, you know, Bun Boy actually lost legitimately, but he doesn't believe us. Okay? Because naturally, he's too drunk, and we could not get his wallet out in order to get in the gate. But the gate guard waved us through because he sees three guys with IDs, a taxi driver, and this drunk dude. <laughs> so we got in, and he, you know, he gave us a hard time. It's like, you can't find my wallet to get me in through the gate, but you could find my wallet in time to pay the taxi driver. <laughs> <laughs> well, we had more time. But he genuinely lost the Valve game. And so that's where I go home, I crash, and are later waking up by the fighter by the fire alarm. So I've told that backwards, but that's what I generically refer to as the live bait incident. <laughs> now, as a first lieutenant, you know, you're you're kind of a fledgling fighter aviator, right? You're still learning. You still have to give yourself some credibility. And as a non-drinker, right, I'm not going to gain credibility through any feats of alcoholic consumption. So that's one of the things about Tug's stories, you know, who's an RAF Phantom pilot on earlier episodes, is Tug confirms, of course, that the RAF are a raging pack of alcoholics. <laughs> um, but nevertheless, you know, he has all these alcohol stories. I don't have those alcohol consumption stories. But I gained first lieutenant points because I would do anything sober that those guys had to be drunk to consider. So if you're doing crazy ass shit, I'll do it sober. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I got points in kind of a backwards ass way. Not like anybody is keeping track, but um, <clears throat> it gains you some aviator cred that has nothing to do with aviation skills and everything to do with fighter aviation culture. What's, what's that? In live bait. Uh, but, but, but those things, um, you know, not, not that I want to sound like I didn't just hear what you said, but were, you know, could you turn up to a squadron and opt out of doing those things? The, I, I, I asked because, so I was at Seymour Johnson recently, um, as you know, and, you know, th there were just some things that I noticed around, you know, sort of, you know, people not sort of hanging out together that, you know, sort of Friday at the squadron bar, I think has gone, um, you know, and I, I was talking to some of the guys there and they were saying, you know, this fighter, fighter culture now is not what it used to be. You know, you, you know, pe people don't hang out together socially anymore. They don't go to the bar together. There, there aren't all these sort of events organized around the fighter squadron, um, many of which involve alcohol. Um, and sort of, you know, with the alcohol element, I suppose, is debatable whether or not you need it. Obviously, you don't. You, you, you've you just shown that you can be involved in something and there not be alcohol uh, at the front and center. But uh, I, I suppose what I was most surprised about when I was at Seymour was just the fact that that, that has always been, to me at least, a, a cent central part of being in a fighter squadron. That's what I've observed. I've not been in a fighter squadron, but that's my obs observation. You know that 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 people bond and spend time together, and the trust is formed out of the cockpit as well as in the cockpit. So, I, I'm just curious to see, you know, how much of that was an opt-in type thing, and whether or not, you know, if you were joining a fighter squadron, you did that, and there was no discussion. So I opted out of what I felt I needed to opt out of. Um, there, the deglamorization of alcohol has definitely put a damper on Friday nights at the squadron. I don't think that's a bad thing because it has also put a damper on a bunch of bad behavior um, and uh, poor management, I think, of your resource and your community. The difference is deployment. When you're on deployment, you're doing a bunch of stuff together because you are together. When you are not on deployment, you don't have to. And so plenty of guys don't. Um, and so you've got more freedom now to it's you know Friday night. I got something else to do. You know, I'm halfway through the Witcher series on Netflix, or I've got three 10% true episodes I haven't watched and I'm binge watching, you know, whatever you want to do on a Friday night, which may be go out to a country and Western bar and line dance, whatever. 
um, or go race an old Volkswagen bug around a dirt track. It doesn't matter. You, you, your life when you're at home base, um, you may want some separation from the squadron because that has always been a problem with the squadron is that you can just get sucked into it and spend too much time there. And so I would say it's a work-life balance thing. And when your, your life no longer revolves around alcohol, um, then you're kind of free to scatter. So I, I think it's actually a positive development. But if you saw that same group of guys, you know, and gals in the squadron, and they were deployed to Tampere, Finland, totally different ball game. Um, they'd all be out together. They'd be singing songs. They'd be hammered, and they'd be eating salmon and reindeer noises. Yeah. Noses. They're called noisettes, but we just refer to them as reindeer noses, even though they're not reindeer noses. <laughs> So that was Zaragoza. Good experience. It turns me right around to I want my first combat deployment, which is to go down to uh, Iraq for or to Saudi Arabia for Desert Calm. And uh, that's where I, I managed to do that. And and Jason Dahlquist and I, we had been matched in everything. Same core class, same EWO, same far track, same water survival. It's another story I'll tell someplace else. Same land survival. Um you know, same lift, same weasel school, F4. I mean, we were neck and neck, same green flag, same Zaragoza. And he was supposed to go on the the, the first deployment to Saudi Arabia that the new lieutenants were going to. And I said, oh, I got to go with Jason. So I pushed hard to get, not realizing that I was actually bumping Jason. So Jason <laughs> <was> bumped. <laughs> So I become a Desert Storm veteran on paper because even though I never flew a sortie in the store in the storm, I arrive four days before the end of the time period. So I get the ribbon and everything. Um, even though I never literally never flew a sortie there. And then we were in Saudi Arabia, and this is where some real learning happens because in Saudi Arabia, um, there are essentially no flight rules. Um, you have the run of the eastern province on the air and the ground. Uh, you're flying up over Kuwait. You're flying over the Persian Gulf. We got a good team. Brian Baxley is there. The uh, Spike Beneshek uh, had been there in the rotation before. There's a little bit of overlap. Um, you know, Brian Reno, really a bunch of good dudes, Craig Croxton. And uh, our our detachment commander is Steve Heil, call sign Siggy. Sieg Heil, of course. Uh, and See, he's a great deco. He's laid back. He's a good pilot. He's a good instructor. Um, you know, he's the guy who I talked about on the on the last episode. Hey, you know, Star Baby, get up there and drive us home. But he also had certain rules. Like you could not be lower or faster than Steve Heil. <laughs> okay, so those were easy because he always flew tail number 209, which was the fastest jet in the squadron. So you could not be faster than Steve Heil unless you were stroke and blower, and maybe not even then. And if you were lower than Steve Heil, you'd better have your gear and flaps down. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, uh, we had some actually mobile threats. Some threat simulators had been moved down uh, to Saudi Arabia, so we had an EW range. We could, uh, we had, as a composite wing, so you want to fly against the Eagles, you want to fly against the Saudis, you want to fly against the Brits, you want to fly with them, strike packages, you can do all of that. Uh, you're flying over Saudi Arabia and learning a lot. Um, you're looking over the border with your sensors, so you're seeing Iranian radars and seeing uh, uh, the occasional Iraqi radar, although they tended not to come up. Um, you know, you're learning what the electromagnetic environment is, all the ambiguities in the Gulf from shipping radars. I got to fly against the USS Normandy, which is a Ticonderoga-class cruiser. And boy, those guys, not only is their radar tough on a detection system, but they basically had me dialed in and dead before I even finished identifying them. I mean, the Aegis is that good. I don't know why we even flew against them, other than the fact they wanted us to fly by. And that was the greatest, we had a great radio call one day. So Bassa and I are out over the Gulf. It's most of the time I'm flying with Bassa. Uh, and we're out over the Gulf, and uh, we're exercising with the Normandy, and they are just calling us dead at ridiculously long ranges. And, you know, we finally, they let us get close. And the reason they let us get close turns out to be, hey, uh, request flyby, our mast height is 148 feet. <laughs> like, rock on. 
but we're not going to fly over the ship because that's just stupid. So we fly down alongside, we drop a couple of flares, everybody's happy, we get some good training, uh, and we go home. And also, uh, we had plans. So Bossa and I had planned to um, pay a visit to the Iranians. And we're, I'm not sure still whether or not we'd have ever gone through with this, but all F-4 bases have the same set of ground, tower, and approach frequencies. Because our AUX radio, the receive-only radio on the left side, is a crystal radio. And the 20 channels were set by crystal, and they were the same for every F-4 ever built. Which means that's why all bases that used to hold F-4s have the same ground and tower and control frequencies. Because of that damn crystal radio. And so the Iranians had the same frequencies. So we wanted to go and request a touch and go. Uh, or a low approach at uh, Bandar Abbas Air Base. Um, because they weren't as uptight then as they were now, uh, as they are now. And so um, we thought we might have been able to pull it off. But our new ops officer came down and and uh, there was always the danger that he was going to be a bit of a wanker about it. So we never actually pulled it off. Uh, but like I said, whether or not. But we, I mean, Brian and I did accidentally fly into Iranian airspace. Because we didn't understand the Navy code words. I mean, we're out over the Persian Gulf. We're rooting around. You know, the INS is drifting. We haven't had an update. We know it can be a couple miles off. We're trying to stay outside the 12-mile limit. Um, and, you know, we get this code word on guard, Mustard Charlie. Some Navy guy brought a, broadcasting Mustard Charlie. It's like, huh, wonder who that's for. <laughs> then it goes to Mustard Bravo. Huh, wonder who's that for. And then it's Mustard Alpha. Huh, wonder what the hell that means. Now, some guy's getting yelled at on the radio. Well, a guy getting yelled at. <laughs> Mustard Charlie means you're like within, you're, you're like between 20 and 10 miles of Iranian airspace. Mustard Bravo means between your zero and 10 miles. I, those are arbitrary numbers. I don't remember what they actually are. But Mustard Alpha definitely means you're in Iranian airspace. It's like, man, some dude's getting yelled at. <laughs> Us. Um, You know, and we... We also, there were things to do in Saudi Arabia back in the day. It wasn't the, it was still an oppressive atmosphere. And you went everybody in uniform, everywhere in uniform. But when you went everywhere in uniform, you're the tall white guys in uniform. You know, people get out of your way in the street. It took another two years before people just kind of dismissed you, fucking Americans. Yeah. Um, but people would get out of your way. You're going everywhere in camouflage. We're driving around in a bunch of Ford LTD Crown Victorias. Because the Japanese had felt guilty about not participating in the war. So afterwards, or late in the war, they bought a whole shitload of Ford LTV Crown Vicks for all the American detachments in Saudi Arabia. So gas was free on base, 15 cents a gallon off base. Okay, we're driving around, you know, we're getting lost, we're exploring, we're going places. Um, and one of the places we go uh, is the Hofuf Camel Market. So Hofuf is apparently the biggest oasis in the world. Uh, it, there's a bunch of caves there in the sandstone. It's historical. You know, I mentioned it before. We have the the Saudi National Forest, which is a double row of Lebanese pines. And I still don't know if that sign in English was a joke or whether it's actually the Saudi National Forest. But anyway, it actually has a sign, two rows of Lebanese pines, and it says Saudi National Forest. Uh, and we're going down and... and you know, we got some rough, there's no GPS. We had some, rough, there's no maps. There's some rough directions to how to get to Hofuf. Um, and in the Eastern province, the signs are in English and Arabic. That's how you know you've left the Eastern province. When you stop seeing English signs, it's, you know, turn around now because you will, they will not even find your bodies in the desert. Um, and I knew that Joe Yakubik, Yak is absolutely the worst ground navigator in the history of ground navigation. <laughs> and so I was driving and my plan was, I knew I had to make a right turn, but I couldn't remember whether it was this right turn or the next right turn. And I knew uh, I had my plan, which was to wait until Yak told me to make a right turn and ignore him. <laughs> so it happens exactly like that. He goes, hey, make a right turn here. I go straight. He looks at me like I'm just another asshole in the driver's seat. I make the falling right turn and we go straight to the camel market. <laughs> and at the camel market, I mean, there's, there's a shitload of camels. And I learned a lot about camels. Like, um, I expected them to smell bad. I didn't realize how noisy they are. 
I didn't realize that one of the ways um, that you tell your camel herds apart is you style their hair. So the whole bunch of camels with like punk flat tops in fluorescent colors. Uh, and, you know, there's a bunch of Americans standing around in uniform and uh, we find a bunch of other Americans, Dave Siegel and his family, who are Americans uh, who are living there as expatriate oil workers uh, uh, just north of Daron at the uh, uh, working the desalination plant is actually what he's doing now or near the desalination plant uh, up in, I think, Jubail. But, you know, he's showing us around the camel market. We just run into this guy and his family. And this kid comes up and starts to offer camel rods. And you know, guys are going to go, how much? It's like 10 reals. And 10 reals is $3.75. It's fixed. Okay, so um, 10 reals. Okay, so guys go around. I'm not going to do a camel rod because I don't want my ass to smell like camel hair for the entire drive home. Right? So uh, I'm going to skip the camel rod. And one of the pilots, Jethro, Mark Fowl. Mark Fowl is a tall, broad-shouldered dude. And he decides he's not going to pay 10 reals for a camel ride. So he says to the kid that's that's the camel, uh, that's, you know, leading the camel around, he says, no, five reals. The kid says, 10 reals. Five reals. Okay, five reals. So Jethro, feeling like he's just won a battle, gets up on the camel. Kid walks him around. Okay, I'm ready to get down now. Five reals. <laughs> So it's five more reals to get off the camel. It's not going to tell the camel to kneel until he gets his five reals. So everybody's had their ride. The kid walks off with his camel and Dave Siegel, remember the guy who actually lives there, looks at me and says, and the best part of that whole thing is that's not even his camel. <laughs> a kid had seen this opportunity, grabbed a camel, and all the Arabs are watching this 11-year-old kid fleece a bunch of Americans. <laughs> Good on him. That's brilliant. But the that it turned out to be a great connection because what I had done, because I'm coming into Saudi Arabia for the first time, you know, so I need to prepare. What can I bring into Saudi Arabia that might be useful to the expat community? Hams. So I went to the BX and I bought 10 small canned hams and I smuggled them into Saudi Arabia in my luggage. And so um, I now have these hams. So when I show up, Dave Siegel invites us up for a party, and they have a party in the expat uh, community generally every couple of weeks because it takes them that long to brew a new batch. And uh, <laughs> uh, I show up with a ham, and I'm a freaking hero. They won't even open the ham. They say they're going to hold a ham party. That's their thing. If they get a canned ham, they have a ham party where they have a party. Everybody gets one freaking slice of ham. And then you have a you know this potluck party event, and it's like okay. So I show up now to the ham party with more ham. So I had ten canned hams to give out. <laughs> we were set. Any weekend we wanted to go to a party up at the expat compound, Star Baby shows up with a ham. Next deployment, I did it with bacon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, brilliant! Um, and vanilla. Um, because Is vanilla it, forbidden. Uh, it's dissolved in alcohol. Oh. So it's in high demand for baking and for flavoring the products of your distillery. Wow. Much more compact than hams. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, and I, I have my smuggling methods, which I'm not going to tell online, um, all perfectly legal. They they exploit cultural blind spots, but I don't want to blow it for the next guy that needs to smuggle 10 bottles of uh, vanilla into Saudi Arabia. So uh, that one's not going to get recorded. I'll put it in my book. If I ever get around to writing it. Oh, that's cool. Um, so there we go. Saudi Arabia, you know, first deployment, learned a lot, uh, came back. We're living in Kobar Towers. Um, and uh, I'm sharing a, uh, it's a, like three bedrooms to a bathroom. So I've got Joe Yakovic and Bun Boy. And Joe Yakovic and I, we, one of the things we cannot stand is a dirty bathroom. So alone under the weasel bathrooms, ours was spick and span all the time. Um, yeah, it's one of the first things we do. Bun Boy, on the other hand, not only can stand one, but appears to sleep not on a bed, but on a pile of his own laundry. <laughs> um, but one afternoon, you know, we're we're out, we've got nothing to do, and we have a bidet in the bathroom. We have no use for a bidet. They're not even sure what the bidet is for or how <laughs> they were not going to experiment. 
but we realize we can turn it into a planter. So we go into Dharan with Safeway, get some potting soil, an aloe plant, some desert grass, and some plant lights. And we redo our bidet as a planter. Because now we took a, an orange juice concentrate can, which we hollow out both ends to put over the little fountain. So now we have a fountain that we can use to water it every now and then. But aloe is good for sunburn. So if you take an aloe plant and you break off a tip, you could actually rub that against a sunburned area. So we actually had some thought. And we had our bidet planter in the bathroom until we left. That's the kind of thing you do in, in Saudi Arabia. Oh, I will tell you, I had one of the best restaurant meals of my life there. Ah, uh, you know, that was purely by accident. And it took us four hours to eat. And I don't know if the guy ate the next day. Just what in was down it? Restaurant. It was French food. It was at the Les Meridiennes, which is the same hotel chain that you would see in Paris. And Air France was having a convention. So they had brought down one of the chefs from a five-star hotel in Paris to set up a buffet. And it was amazing. And the only reason we went there uh, is because we were going to go to the Sandbach, which was our normal seafood restaurant. But the left turn was always a nightmare. There was a long line to make the left turn. And we had uh, Debbie Espejo in the car with us. Debbie Espejo was a, a uh, weather forecaster who had formerly been married to uh, uh, another weasel, Iwo. Um, and, but she was deployed. He wasn't. Um, and so, you know, she was already like a member of the family. So we would go out together and, you know, she said, well, why don't we just go to the Meridian? So instead of waiting 15 minutes to make a left turn against Saudi traffic, we went to the Meridian and just looked in on this five-star convention buffet that took us four hours to eat. And we didn't even walk out of the restaurant. We kind of just oozed <laughs> out of the restaurant. <laughs> I don't even know how we drove home. I don't know how I fit behind the steering wheel. It's probably me that was driving anyway. Oh, yeah, that was awesome. Although I did, I, I'm i food adventurous, so I did not read any of the labels on the food on the first pass. So I did eat a thing or two that I would not normally have eaten had I read. Deep fried sheep brain. Oh, okay. This was before CJD. Um, and... Uh, yeah, it tastes like soggy cauliflower, only not as good. Now you know. It's still an improvement over British food. <laughs> you knew that was coming. I could see by the narrowing of the eyes. It's just a matter of time, isn't it? It is. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. Ask a question. What the hell? Yes, I, I, I do want to ask a question. So I, so the first question is, we've got a really long list of things to go through, and I don't think we're going to have time in this episode. So we're going to have to come back and do a part two. So that's more of a statement than a, than a question. But okay. I, I'm curious to know, uh, back on the subject of the F4G then, and uh, sorry, that's my daughter outside the door trying to come in. Um, I'm curious. To, <laughs> it's really difficult to concentrate. Can you hear it? She's going, papa, papa. No, good. It's good. I'm pleased you can't hear it. All right. Okay. I better do this. Fucking hell. All right. No, you're not going to cut it out. You never no. do. <laughs> Forget again. Um, so I'm, I'm curious to know then, you got there four days before officially um, Operation Desert Storm came to an end. Um, we have had, or I have had Spike talk about Desert Storm. You introduced um, him to me. So thank you for doing that. And, and he talked for an hour or 40 minutes, an hour and 40 minutes, something like that, about his experiences. But I'm keen to understand, when you arrived then in theatre, what the brief was that you were given around what had happened between the wild weasels and this the Iraqi SAM operators? So a SAM tactics, a post-war SAM tactics analysis team is a routine kind of event. I later joined the European SAM tactics analysis team, Um and, I mean, this happens even in peacetime. The TATs and the ETATs are, yeah, TATs and it was something like that. European SAM tactics, the ESTAT. European tactics analysis is ETAT. But TATs and STATs happen all the time. Uh, like on a six-month or annual rotation, even in peacetime. So that was going to be my advantage, that I was going to be in the weapon shop and study like crazy. So by the time I arrive at Spangdalem, the first data is coming out, where it's actually an after-action report. And before I left Spangdalem, hard data is now available on where we had actual statistics, harms shot, SAMs killed um, for all ha uh, harm shooters. 
and stuff like that. Because one of the things that the F4G had is it had a digital tape recorder uh, worth 90 minutes that was unmatched. If an electron hit the airplane, it went on the recorder. And one of the beauties of the recording system called Conrack was that you actually played it back on an APR 47. Mm -hmm. So it was not a simple playback. You didn't have to limit yourself to what the EWO was looking at at the time. You can select any element to the electronic order of battle. Um, and you could look at it as if you were in the airplane at that time and sort it out. So with that tool available, although it didn't happen on all sorties because it takes a lot of time to debrief it, um, you know, guys had high confidence that when the timer elapses on your harm shot and the radar suddenly goes down, that's a kill. So all that data became available to me and I read everything. You know, if it came out, you know, it was in the weapon shop, I read it. That was going to be, and that has always been, you know, some of my advantage is I study at incredible detail. Um, and now, you know, I, I, at that stage, I know what I'm looking at and I know what I'm looking for. Um, so by the time I rolled down, um, to Saudi Arabia, I've got a good idea what happened. By the time I leave Spangdalem, I have a really good idea what happened. Um, plus because we had, had opened the Southern no-fly zone and I had my first initial, I was logging combat time over the Southern no-fly zone. I felt at least I had some combat time, even though I still felt, um, like I was an imposter. So, so what was the general sense then? The the community had performed well, the airplane had performed well, the harm had performed well. Um, was the Iraqi threat? Um, yeah, was there was there any any amount of parity between what you were doing and what the Iraqis were trying to do? Were you were they massively outclassed? Technical overmatch? What did, what was the sort of you know the, what was the assessment of, of what had happened? The Iraqis were outclassed, and there was a tactical overmatch. But more important, there was a training overmatch. So make no mistake about it, uh, outmatched. You know that's a quality issue, but they had quantity. Those were the densest air densest air defenses the United States military has ever encountered. Uh, we're over Baghdad. And they had some successes, and there were just Sam's freaking everywhere. If you can be in an F4G, you know, and ditch your two harm supporting a strike package in like less than six to nine minutes, that's a dense environment. And that was happening all the time um, as you got close to well-defended areas. So we had a better picture, and, and I, it's interesting to hear Spike tell it. And that by the end of the war, he had gained significant confidence because of his training levels. So when I entered, um, I, there was there was no cloud of doubt hanging over the weasel skill set, either in their minds or anybody else's. The electronic combat triad, F4G wild weasels, the EF-111s, and the EC-130 compass calls, we kicked ass. We did exactly what those aircraft and what those systems were designed to do and did it well. And to have the U.S. Air Force focus not on that, on the electronic warfare victory, but the F-117 um, is the split point at which the Air Force makes a critical cultural mistake and largely shit cans electronic warfare in favor of stealth. And we have yet to see how that plays out. That's a recurring a theme in some of the conversations that we've had and I noticed in one of the YouTube comments I don't know if it's Hoops Hooper is an F4G guy um, or somebody else in one of the comments on Spike's episode mm -hmm. says you know 25 years ago the Air Force figured out um, you know through AI and the ability to pick out targets in um, it's not even clutter it's noise he's saying about you. you've got lo loads of noise but you're, so your, your target signal is is weaker than the ambient noise of the signal coming back at you, but you can use AI to pick a target out. And 25 years ago, we realized that the the newest Soviet radars, radars and threat systems were going to be able to do that, and therefore stealth was not going to be a viable way of, of pinning, I suppose, all of your hopes on, on winning a war. Um, what, what, what uh, so I'm keen to understand what what is what happens or what has happened or has not happened then within the Air Force to allow that let's say mistake in inverted commas to persist. So you've got an entire weapon system in the form of or, or MDS in the form of the F-35. 
You've got the F-22, all of which are based on the principles or, or require stealth in order to, to work, let's say, you know, the ability to get into um, a MES and kill a radar before it can see them, or the ability to get into a WES and kill a, 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 a bad guy fighter before it can see them, whatever. That's the principle. So, so, so either it works or it doesn't, and I'm confused. Does it work or does it not work? And if it doesn't work, why aren't people talking about it? RF low observability, radio frequency low observability, what people call stealth, always works. Okay, it always gets you something. Radar cross-section matters because you have a radar range equation, and the radar range equation doesn't change, and one of the variables in is it is the radar cross-section the target. So it may get you closer, but that's technical stuff, okay? And that's, that's radar low observability. You have to worry about IR low observability if you're in clear air. You have to worry about the transmissions you're making. The F-117 had a bunch of advantages. One, until Panama, right before the Gulf War, nobody even knew what it looked like. We did not send pictures out in advance so that people could make detailed 3D models and run it through a computer simulation. There was no signal processing that I was aware of whereby you could extract a signal from below noise level. I first saw that in 2000 while I was doing some support for DARPA during my penalty year in industry. Um, in which guys could, uh, and it wasn't a radar signal processing there. It was a great little project where the guys came up, they were showing off, they say, hey, if you know, um, how do you get this? If you know the number of guns firing, we can deduce the firing pattern from the way the, from the number of rounds hitting your aircraft went. And I said, this is not a useful technology. I said, why don't you look at radar signal processing? I don't know if that had any impact, but after that, we saw a radar signal processing thing. So that didn't exist in the Gulf War. Nobody knew what the 117 felt like. The Russians, the Soviets had discarded the faceted approach because everybody knew you can't make a faceted airplane fly. Well, that was everybody who didn't have the flight controls from the YF-16. And the F-117 was, his thermal signature was ridiculously low. It was baffled and vented on the top of the aircraft. It was a non-afterburning engine. They sucked in their, all their antennas. They didn't even transmit on the radio. They had no radar warning gears. So they had no raw antennas. They were quiet. And they were a ridiculous overmatch. And so the cultural mistake you made is that that overmatch, um, if you could just make it cooler, right? The F-135, the F-22, they're cooler. They're stealthy and they're fighters. They have radars and they have afterburning engines and they have data links and they have radios and it's like, Okay, yeah, so you have radio frequency, low observability, and you have all this stuff that made the 117 really hard to find and detect, and you toss it away. In the meantime, the adversary went, oh, no kidding, you can fly a faceted airplane, and you can fly a curved and blended airplane. Um, And everybody does RF low observability now uh, when you can design it in. And so, and you see even the radio frequency, uh, because now the physics is well understood, uh, the radio frequency from threat systems trending in another direction towards where they will be more effective. Um, and that's where you make a mistake, is that stealth and electronic warfare were never an either or, and the Air Force treated it as an either or. And they always should have been around stealth and electronic warfare, and they would have a much more capable uh ecosystem than they do today there's a new um oh, i'm going to expose my my uh, lack of research here but there's a new um ec platform that the air force is building it's going to replace ec-130 i think isn't it it's based on like the ec-37 like is it 37? Is it based on like a Gulfstream 5 or something like that? Or is, oh, it's a Bombardier 550, but I could be wrong. Yeah, so it's, a bit, it's one of the big done. business jets. Um, do, do, does that sort of signal, we're, we're getting off track, but, but but quickly then just to wrap up this sort of thought process, then does that signal to you, because there, there appear to be other indications that the Air Force is beginning to, um, I sort of, I don't know whether or not it's beginning to sort of regret the decisions that it made to disassemble that electronic triad, but, but to, to take EW, the... Um, art and the science of it a little bit more seriously now. Is, is that an indication to you that the Air Force is, is moving back in a direction that's more pleasing to see? Not even a little bit. It's an indication that they had to replace the EC-130 airframe. 
So okay. it means that they've stopped the bleeding, um, not that they haven't already bled out. It's like stopping the bleeding after the patient's already dead. Um, can, can you bring the patient back to life? I mean, one of the things I've heard from somebody, I, I don't know if they work on um, that program, but uh, that, that with the airframe comes, the new airframe comes some substantial capabilities Im improvements. And um, well, It's true, but it's still a standoff jammer. When you start matching electronic warfare capabilities in a combat aircraft and not a combat support aircraft, and you rebuild the Wazel School, those are the criteria that I would say indicate the Air Force is taking EW seriously. Until those two events happen, or at least one of those two events, they're still not taking EW seriously. And they won't. Hmm. Because the other aspect of this is in 1996, all the Air Force's expertise went away. And they have not gotten it back. They outsourced it to the Navy, um, so the Navy still has some. But the two-star... Uh, that was at Eglin overseeing EW, gone. All the EWOs, gone. I mean, we still generate fighter EWOs, but they never do fighter EWO things. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, the the we've all aged out of the system. One of the interesting things I did see, though, is, is on an interesting segue, is that the Navy is moving away from the E-6, the Takamo Command and Control. They're putting that, I think, in a C-130 airframe. And I found out, you know, just through casual conversations that they had pulled back like 70 and 80 year old dudes out of retirement, given them clearances and asked them how they used to do C-130 based command and control systems. Really? Yeah. So until the Air Force does that, um, I don't think you're getting your EW back. Um, on the other hand, you know, there is a new element of it in the increased use of cyber, on um, which I don't even speculate on in public, but, uh, um, you know, that has to be folded in. But again, um, it's not a be-all and end-all solution. Can you just describe, you're not going to speculate it, but can you describe what cyber is then? So um, everybody understands, this, you know, using cyber, the cyber domain, cyber warfare, attacking computer networks through computer networks and communications. Um so the Russians do it all the time. It happens economically. Ransomware is an example. You know, the North Koreans steal Bitcoins left, right, and center um, or rip off the Bank of Bangladesh. Um, these kind of things, this is all cyber warfare. Can you, you know, shut down a, an industrial plant? Can you screw up train schedules? All those kind of things. You know, how far you can reach into an air defense network is questionable because people certainly make efforts to protect those. That makes your problem harder, not impossible okay well we're, we're a long way from talking about uh, green flag which i think was probably going to be the next thing that was on our list of things to talk about so your first your first green flag um back in 1991 uh 19 yeah 1991 no we did that that was my green flag with that was that was the green flag thing okay all right okay um but well, well, well i've got i've got 20 minutes so what do you want to do with that time do you want radar. to do you want to talk to the video we should talk okay. about the radar okay okay so i've talked about radar before and um, now I'm going to bring one up. So this flight is from my final flight in the F4G, 1,010.1 hours. I'm flying with Dave Sandalusha, who is also the pilot. I flew um, my first crew solo in the F4G. So I came full circle. Um, you need to get him on the show, which means I need to talk him to coming on the show. But okay. not it. his wife thinks he needs to do it. Um, oh, this is good. So, uh so we'll try and work that out. But he's in the front seat. We are Badger 2. And I don't know why we're Badger 2. Um, because Badger is Dave Susanna's call sign. Um, all right. So you're seeing the screen. I am seeing the screen. Yes. All right. So let me just give you a start. And then we're going to roll it back to the start. This is a B-scope. And you guys have seen B-scope. But here, this line up the center is, that's right off the nose of the aircraft. This is 30 left, 30 right. And um, uh, the limits of the scope are 60 left and 60 right. The range markings, I'm probably starting on a 50-mile scope. So these would be 10-mile range markings. These are my AX symbols. I've got a little hand controller. This is like my mouse. Okay. This gunk along the bottom is the altitude line. So our the radar, we think of it throwing a radar beam in one direction, and it does, but it also throws secondary beams called side lobes in all other directions. So this line of white goo down on the bottom is the, the ground. 
It is the side lobe bouncing off the ground and coming back into my receiver. And this line is the ground clutter because this radar today is broken. Uh. It is unstabilized. So normally the gyro keeps the radar stabilized. So you are sweeping your radar beam leveled with the ground. We are unstabilized because I'd have a fake horizon in the scope if we weren't um, because stabilization is not working. And so our radar beam is sweeping level with the wings. Yep. So every time Santa makes a correction, we're changing our radar beam and we're sweeping at an angle and we're not going to find Jack. So this is an ACM engagement, two of us against one bad guy. Uh, we're going to start not in a perch setup, but it's an intercept to ACM. And here we go. Every time you see this swath of white goo across the scope, you know that we're not flying level. It's so does this, this, this view here, does that indicate a 90 degree bank turn to the left? Um, I have no freaking idea. I've never correlated it. Okay. Um, because I, uh, I mean, flying stab out is a mode that you fly when, when your stab is broken. Yeah. Uh, I'm working through a, a thing that I've never really correlated well. Okay. We hit from him. Going downhill. Here we go. Right there. Now we're naked. We're naked, of course, right before you hear that beep means that there's nothing on the radar warning. We're going to get something on the radar warning, and I'm going to use this to try and cue my radar. Zero 32 miles. Off the dog. Here. That's what you nailed, man. Nails just means I've got a signal. I've got his, I've got the adversary's radar, but he's not on me. I was about three one zero now. I've switched scopes. I'm now in a B narrow. Okay, since I have the azimuth, I go into a narrow scope. So instead of sweeping 120 degrees, uh, I'm sweeping 60 degrees, and so that obviously increases the time between sweeps. You can do this in any AI radar. Yeah, uh, would you, if you could, please let me know when you're done. I brought 49 so I can now let the air carry come back. Sorry. I'll move it to the lap. Yeah, that's right. Well, uh, you can have it back now. So the traffic that's going on in the background, we're over Death Valley. And normally our airspace was capped, in this case, at 29,000 feet. And that was air traffic control asking for it back. What we didn't know is that the adversary here, who is this faint dash... Right here, that's my first hit, second hit, because I got a brighter one before. Um, he has apparently coordinated to, with air traffic control to come in at 33,000 feet without telling us. <laughs> 20 miles. miles. <laughs> Way up there, thirty-three pounds. Oh, no big old. There he is. It's at sixteen nautical miles, about fifty-five degrees left. Um, you know, we have a bunch of problems. Also broken is I do not have my IFF interrogator. I do not have my combat tree functioning. So you call Bandit Bandit? That was the lead called Bandit Bandit because his stuff worked. Okay, so he's run through the electronic ID and called Bandit not hostile. Okay, so Bandit says it's a hostile air or an enemy aircraft, but uh, you have to say hostile. Hostile means an enemy aircraft with clearance to engage. Okay, got it. Yeah, got it. If he is coordinated and out, to damn, try it again. That quick, that quick. Uh, so you see my acquisition symbols are kind of creeping down the scope. That is pure star baby estimation on our closing speed. It's and, and just before you carry on, so is this so you're unstabilized, but now presumably you are 
uh, wings level or something approaching wings level, you've got him offset to the left. Is this then for a typical display you'd expect from a, a fully working APQ120? No, I would not have all this amazing amount of bright goo on the scope because okay. you're never wings level. So we are A, the wingman, and two, we're bracketing. So um, you've heard the bracket called. So uh, we're, we've gone right. Flight lead's gone left. We're now going to converge. As a okay. result of that, we are never wings level. So we're, we're not, not wings level of this entire uh, approach. Okay. And really, it's a miracle that we're as stable and predictable as we are and a tribute to Santa's flying abilities. Like you not want. Okay, with a cutback direction. So we have semi good situational awareness from the radio calls and decent situational awareness from the RWR. And so even though I don't have a range, uh, Santa can look at my axe symbols and because I've been moving them down, that's the estimated range all the time. Um, so just getting those couple of hits intermittently and knowing what the closure should look like is helpful from an SA standpoint. Okay. The odd one. That 30, 20 left. I've gone to a 10 mile scope is what I'm probably on now. And because we're maneuvering, I'm no longer confident that I've got my narrow sector centered up properly, so I go to wide. Look, look everywhere. Okay, got him off the nose. So that bright spot off the nose that is coming down the scope is our bandit. That is our flight lead. Okay. I know that situationally because, again, IFF's broken and uh, my interrogator's broken and it's not helping me out. What would you see? So if you, you, you if, if it were working, what would you be seeing there that would tell you that it was one was a bandit and one was friendly? I would see a friendly squawk. So you see a number underneath those underneath the No, dot? I would actually see either a bar below the contact or a bar below and above the contact, okay. depending on mode and code. Okay. Damn. Yeah, if you're not, it's off the road five high, six miles. Now we get into the, I don't have a TD box even if I'm locked. I'm having a hard time getting a lock because we're maneuvering. Um, so now, but I know where the guy is. Five, mi five degrees high, six miles. I want to talk the pilot's eyeballs out of this because we don't have a TD box on the HUD. We don't even have a HUD. And, and how do you know he's five miles, uh, sorry, five degrees high? You're using the antenna tilt function? Yeah, so what you can't see off the right is a little spike. Um uh, electronic spike that tells me I'm five degrees above level. Okay. It's just this little stick sticking out from the right side of the scope that the camera is not capturing. This is beta tape, by the way. This is a three-quarter inch beta max. Wow. It's amazing that I have this. Locked. Now we're in the ball game. So we have a lock, and you can see, not only do I have the lock... Okay, but I've got all this clutter all the way up and down along the radar line. So that's why I see all these little strobes. This is our steering error circle. That's the dot. We're going to center the circle. We're going to. This is going to be two aim, seven shots. Um, and the uh, and followed by an aim nine. And these big horizontal lines right here are my uh, really my R max lines. Uh, and my Armin, could that be Armin? It could be. Um, those are my range indicators. And what's going to happen after a shot is because there's limited processing. So I, the computer cannot generate another image on this scope. This is all you've got. My Casio digital watch has more processing power than this computer does. Um, that line will drop to the bottom and start moving up the scope. That's our flyout marker. It's not in seconds. It's purely visual. So when you saw the horizontal line disappear, we now have our R Max out here and our R Min down along along the bottom. So that must have been like R Max two um, that disappeared. Um, that's when the shot was taken. Uh, Santa calls it a little bit later, but the dot is in the hole, 
We can take shots with the dot outside the hole if you throw the interlocks to out, but that mm -hmm. shot's going to miss. That was one of the major causes in Vietnam of AIM-7s missing, is that aircrew took shots out of parameters. So, so you want to have that dot, which is the steering circle nowadays in, in, in sort of modern parlance. Uh, you want to have that in the middle of the, the display? You just have to have it inside the circle, and those are the interlocks in. The missile will hack it. And, and what are, sorry, just for, for, again, I don't actually know what they are. What are the interlocks? Oh, so the interlocks is a pure software inhibit, whereby if you squeeze the trigger and um, the dot is outside the hole, it will not send a fire pulse to the missile. Okay. Um, and there is actually a rule of thumb, and I can't believe I still remember this. You could be dot outside the circle between 5 and 15 nautical miles with an AIM-7F. Okay, but it you you were taking your chances, All right? And we eventually fixed that uh, that that rule of thumb had been fixed by the time I was flying this sortie because the radar tape had been changed. Okay. okay. The fact that it's coming down the sc the scope so slowly tells you that we've got tail aspect on the bandit. He saw lead, turned into lead, basically behind him. We already have a missile in the air. We're taking a second shot. Uh, 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 Santa's going to go for an AIM-9. You'll hear the growl. Do you, so do you, is there a flyout line? Did you say there was a flyout line? Yeah, this the is moving up. That's Okay, so that's the flyout line. That's not your min range then? No, once the okay. once you shoot, the min range drops off because you don't need that information anymore and we can't generate another symbol and it's going to become the flyout. And we can actually generate, if you take a second shot, there's a second flyout that appears. Okay. Two and a half miles. So we timed out two Fox 1s and a Fox 2 in there. And you'll notice there's a couple things. Like I call out two and a half miles because the pilot is not looking at the, the radar scope. He's looking mm -hmm. outside. He's called the tally. There is nothing on the scope uh, or nothing on the HUD because we don't have a HUD. We have a combining glass. It's going to tell him range. So that's the way the comm pretty much has to be. Um, wow. And so when I say that the, the how great the APG-70 was and how the jump from an APQ-120 to an APG-70 is a leap that's bigger than the APG-70 to a, an AESA, a modern AESA radar... That's why. Yeah. That's a pulsed radar, you know, working it um, and not necessarily working it well because one one element of it's busted. There's the obvious question that I don't, I don't think I've asked you this, but we, we sort of touched on it. And I'll make this the, the final question, but the, we, we touched on it a little bit in one of our really earlier episodes. I don't know if it was a, a, a weasel special we did or something like that, where the question came in from the audience about the harm hitting the tail gun of, an, of a B-52 during Desert Storm. And you saying, well, that, you know, that's, you don't think that's actually a real thing. You don't think that actually no, happened. No, I think I said that was categorically false, but yeah. carry on. So, so. So why, uh, so so you in this instance, the video you've just shown us, you've used the APR forty seven to see, which is your your fancy radar warning receiver for, for in the F four G, to see this um, radar energy coming off of the guy that you're flying against. You've helped to use that to cue, you know, where you think the radar should be looking in azimuth, and then you've done your thing. Is it a stupid question to ask why you couldn't fire a harm at him? Why could why would you have to go for an aim seven shot then? Why why couldn't you fire a harm at that guy? It's not a stupid question. There are two key reasons. One is that the harm does not have a radar or optical proximity fuse that looks around three sixty, so does it flies by. Um, it has a different sensing array backed up by an impact fuse. So it's unlikely to fuse on an airplane unless it hits it. And the harm's wings are not designed to intercept an aircraft in flight. They are designed to inter intercept something moving no faster than a destroyer at flank speed. 
which means that they do not have the control authority to turn the missile um, to deal with a high-speed crossing target. Now there's the what if. What if the guy is coming straight at me and I had long considered that if we were faced in the Iraqi no-fly zones against a high-fast flyer, and a high-fast flyer threat to the AWACS is something where everybody is suddenly a defensive counter-air asset. Um, and in that case, if I had the radar on the high-fast flyer, which we assume was going to be a fox bat, I had long planned to put a harm in the air against that threat as the first shot. Um because it would generate a smoke trail that the guy might see. Uh, and who knows, you know, it might not have to make a strong turn because the guy isn't turning. It might not need any of that control authority and it might just hit him. But if it did not hit him, it, uh, it was not going to do any good. That's how I know that the B-52G was um, not hit. I mean, it's one of the reasons I know. It's because the contact fuse by a missile going multiple Mach would have torn the tail off. Hmm. And what you had was you had a bunch of fragment damage, which means that the missile uh, functioned as a proximity fuse, which means it wasn't a harm. Yeah. Um, I also, you know, had full access to the actual report that got back <laughs> the battle damage guys, which I can't discuss, but not a harm. Okay. <laughs> okay. That's telling. Okay, so um, it, it does prompt one more question because I always say it's the last question, but one more question. So, 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 if it's a question of fusing and the and the wings on the missile, um, I want to ask why do you think the air force never built an air to air version of it? Um, you know, the the Russians did it. The Russians have got R twenty sevens with um, you know, RF seeker heads. Um, they've got two versions, I think, a long range version and a short range version. But what, what's you know, why is that not part of the arsenal? Um, I can't really answer that question because I'd wondered that myself. You know, why does the U.S. not field an air-to-air -air anti radiation missile? And they might have come close, by the way, with the sidearm. Um, you know, because it was an air-to-air -air missile converted to an arm, although it would only have had one radar that fell inside its band, one airborne radar, so that might not have been any good. Um, and my answer would have been, why? Um... So the semi-active uh, active missile guidance was pretty good. The AMRAM is phenomenally good. Hmm. Um, so I'm not sure why you would trade away, because when you're looking at an antenna um, in a small diameter, it means that your the direction of arrival is not that fine a measurement. So the smaller your antenna gets... Okay, basically, the broader the error gets on where your signal is coming from. So I think when you go down to air-to-air -to -air missile diameters, you're obviously looking at a case where the, the, the error in your passive reception uh, is more significant than it would be if I, if I had a um, you know, radar antenna the size of a trampoline turned sideways. Oh, I, man, that's going to have a nice tight resolution. But in a missile that's seven, eight, nine inches in diameter, yeah, that's that's a little iffier. So yes, the Russians did it. Their missiles are also bigger. Um, uh, but I don't know of any combat success. Okay. Well, I am definitely at my time limit. Um, and I've got in front of me snacko job car up trench coat and heels air shows julie lee the camel market we've done bacon we've done blackhawk shoot down the anomalous survey clown car brits on deployment the flaming tree what's the sp velocity of velocity or an unladen set of golf clubs um and there's also got to be strippers in a limo which is not on the list but that's something we talked about so those are the things that we have not got through in two hours. It's true. So those are all Nellis things, and we haven't really made it to Nellis. So I'll also show Maverick video when we go to Nellis, but I will close out of the trench coat and eels. So it was a saying that that the way when you came back from deployment, that the way for your spouse to meet you, uh, and of course their spouses were all women at the time, was in the squadron bar at a trench coat and heels with a mattress strapped to her back. <laughs> My wife and this was a strong performance, met me 
in the squadron bar when I came back from my first Saudi deployment in a trench coat, heels, and earrings. And earrings? Yeah. <laughs> yep. It was spectacular. I mean, and it was, it was, that was another thing where you're definitely meeting the imagined standard. Yeah. Trench coat and heels. That's fantastic. It was a joyous reunion. Although, not so joyous until after we left the squadron. <laughs> oh, my goodness. All right. Um, thank you for coming back on and uh, regaling us with yet more Star Baby stories. It's it's always great to speak to you, always great to chat to you, and uh, I'm looking forward to getting back and recording part two with you. Okay, great. So we'll have a part two. Thanks, Steve. <laughs> okay, okay. See you guys See next you. time. See you, man. Thanks for tuning in to 10% True. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Feel free to subscribe, and if you're on YouTube, hit the bell button to make sure you get notified of the next episode. Thanks, and take care.